Okay, we should be live on Facebook and YouTube. I'm just going to verify that fact to make sure everything is working properly as it should. Uh, we are going to be talking about paleontology today with uh, Dr. Adiel Klumpmaker of UA Museums, and we're going to be talking about Harold Station which is a pretty cool place that I have had the great fortune of going to. So uh, I'm excited to talk more about it. Uh, so let me see. I'm not seeing it as of yet, but I know it should be live. So let me just verify so that we're not talking to the air. <laughs> All right. Hang on a second. All right. If anybody is joining us, feel free to ask us any questions in the comment section. And we will get to them uh, when we can during the presentation. Adiel is going to give us a presentation about Herald Station. So uh, just leave us any comments and we'll get to them. And OK, so it looks like we are live on Facebook and we are now live on YouTube. If you want to watch on YouTube, if that's your preference, because uh, I know some people like uh, YouTube a little more than Facebook or maybe they don't have a Facebook, they can watch it on YouTube if you just go to the UA Museum's YouTube channel and find it that way. So I think we're ready to go. So I'll get us uh, started here. Welcome to today's Museums from Your Home live stream presented by the University of Alabama Museums. My name is Rebecca Johnson and I am the communication specialist for UA Museums. And joining me today to talk to us about Herald Station is Dr. Adiel Klumpmaker, UA Museums' curator of paleontology. How are you doing today, Adiel? Very good, how are you doing? Good, like doing. To say hi to everybody too here in the morning, afternoon or evening. Yes, depending on when you watch, it could be any of those times of day. So you got to cover your bases and cover all of them. Uh, well, good. I'm glad you're doing well. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good night uh, for whoever is watching right now. All right. Well, while we are broadcasting here on Facebook and YouTube, uh, we, just feel free to ask us any questions. If you have any uh, questions or comments that you want to leave for ADL, you can do those in the comment section. And uh, please remember anything can happen. This is all live. So hang in there with us in case Facebook has any issues or YouTube has any, any issues or we have any issues because uh, that is liable to happen with the uh, the online activity of this time that we are in. So just uh, be patient with us in case anything happens. We hope nothing will happen, but uh, just in case. Uh, so now that we've gotten all of our business out of the way, Adiel, what exactly is Herald Station and what makes it so unique? So Herald Station is a fantastic site for paleontology. Uh, there is lots of rocks exposed at Herald Station, particularly chalks. Those chalks are Cretaceous in age, and since the 1940s, people have been finding a ton of fossils there. In fact, many vertebrate fossils, but there are also many invertebrate fossils. And all those fossils combined make Herald Station a very unique site uh, in, in this part of the world for Cretaceous paleontology. Yeah, and uh, the University of Alabama is very fortunate to have it. It is the paleontological site of the University of Alabama, so that's how uh, we uh, have access to it. Absolutely, and I prepared a presentation about Herald Stage today, and so I'm gonna gonna talk about that for an important part of this uh, this live broadcast. All right. So I'm gonna pull it up now. Yep, and uh, they can see it audio. So. So hopefully, hopefully everybody's able to see the screen. So that's great, Rebecca. So I'm gonna talk about Herald Station paleontological site. It's really a treasure trove for Cretaceous fossils in, in the state of Alabama. And hopefully after this presentation, I've convinced you that it really is. So this is the United States uh, in the late part of the Cretaceous, so say about 80 million years ago or something like that. It looks very different from, uh, from today, of course, because sea levels were much higher, on average about 200 meters than the present day you have an an interior seaway going from all the way northern Canada to Texas and through the mid part of the United States, as you can see right here from north to south. The southeast part of the United States is partly underwater. As you can see here, Florida is completely inundated by the ocean. And here's the state of Alabama highlighted in a red right here. And as you can see right here, only the northeastern part of Alabama at a time was above the sea level. But the majority of the state was really under sea level influence, at least. And this is also shown by the types of fossils you will find. The fossils you will find in Alabama from the Cretaceous period are going to be predominantly marine in origin. It is they are uh, or, or were living in the ocean back in the days. 
Now, one thing I haven't told you yet so far is this gray area right here. You see gray area are rocks or sediments uh, of that particular age that are exposed and accessible to search when it's not vegetated over at least. Now, I told you the sea level was much higher than, than it is today with about 200 meters, depending on where you are. Uh, but temperatures were much higher as well. So at a time, we're talking really about tropical temperatures in the southeastern part of the United States, very tropical in nature. So here's a map of the state of Alabama. And highlighted here are a number of Cretaceous rock units. So there are different colors here, all the way from gray to about pinkish. The gray ones are about 86 million years old or so, whereas the, the pink ones all the way to the bottom uh, here are about 66 million years old. At about 66 million years old, something very important happened globally, in fact, because an enormous meteorite struck the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. And together with some massive volcanism that was ongoing already, in India, this caused a huge uh, decline in animal diversity on Earth by about 75%. So about 75% of all species vanished. And it includes the dinosaurs that were not able to fly. Those includes uh, pterosaurs or flying reptiles. It includes uh, ammonites that went, around, went extinct around that boundary. It include a variety of other organisms as well uh, that were hit hard, but some were able to survive and, and radiated subsequently again but some did not like the non-flying dinosaurs. So there's one part here that we're gonna be particularly interested in for this presentation, and that is the darker blue color right here indicated. This is called a Morville chalk. And you can see this darker blue color all the way from the, the west part in Pickens County and Greene County. And it's all the way toward the east into ultimately Russell County right here. Now, this is the rock unit we're going to be talking about most because that's the rock unit in which uh, we find fossils at Harrell Station. Now, Harrell Station is located right here in Dallas County, County at this very uh, red dot right here. And I'm going to go to the next slide here. So this is a photograph that was made around 1945 about uh, the Harrell Station area. Back in the days, for your orientation, this here is US Highway 80, right here. Here we have the Cahaba River, which is still there to the present day. Here we've got uh, Ariel, I think uh, we might have lost you a little bit. All right. So hang in there with us. Uh, let's see. I mean, to the left of the audio. Can you hear me? Picture right here. Uh, let's see. All right, hang on a second. I think we've uh, we've got some problems here. Uh, let's see. Water spots and like gray, which faced their land at the time and still often is. And there's very light parts too, which are the chalks, the mortal chalk. They are exposed in the northern part to some extent, and especially in the southern part. This particular picture, you can see uh, lots of chalks being exposed at a time. Now, I should tell you a little bit about the discovery of this site. So let's go back to 1945, when a, a guy called C.M. Um, Barber was exploring uh, the western part of Alabama, but not specifically Arrow Station. And while he was doing that, he found some fossils uh, a little bit to the west of here. At the time, he was working for the Field Museum in Chicago, and he went back that summer and told the paleontologist at the Field Museum in Chicago about the fossils he found in Alabama. The paleontologist was called Rainier Zangerl. You see his name too on the, on the lower right hand side of the screen. He was very interested in it, and the same year, he decided to go back to that part of Alabama. They were finding some fossils there too, but they then heard about Harrow Station where lots of these sharks were exposed. So they actually went there right away and started to find a tremendous number of vertebrate fossils at Harrow Station at this site. So 
they decided to go back in, in 1946, in May of 1946 to be specific. And that's when they found, also found the first dinosaurs ever found in Alabama, in fact. But this site was so rich, they, they had to go back once again. So they went back in 1947, they went back in 1949 and collected all fossils of interest to them at the time. They all brought his fossils back to uh, the Field Museum in Chicago, where these specimens can still be found to the present day. And they started studying them, particularly uh, Rainer Zangerl, who was a uh, paleontologist by profession. All right, Adiel, uh, can you so hear me? Here you see a close up of the main area that was exposed back in the days and still is to the present day. And once again, you see very light areas. And, which are the chalks right here. You see a variety of numbers, right, here, which correspond to major finds of vertebrate fossils back in the days in the, in the 40s. And you see there's also different parcels right here. Now, this is how important part of, of uh, that part that I showed you in the previous slide looks like today on Google Earth. As you can see, there are so many gullies that uh, are exposed and actively eroding and yielding new fossils every year. But another part has been, been overgrown over time, particularly in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, some vegetation took over. Now, I should tell you a little bit too about the, uh, the land around it. So, this char uh, that is exposed at Herald Station is also present under everything else, whether it's overgrown or not. And it's Chalk doesn't let water through relatively easily, so when it rains, it gets soggy real quickly. Uh, and when it's dry, it can get bone dry real quickly as well. And you know, the farmers have recognized this. And they've decided that this the land use is best for agricultural purposes, specifically pastures, also cattle ranching, for example, it's still pretty common to the present day. Uh, Catfish farms are, are quite common in the area as well. But the areas where the gullies are are very rugged and irregular, so they're not very, very useful for cattle farming. Um, and there's not very much vegetation to be found there as well. And it's quite dangerous. Okay, so those gullies have been exposed for a very long time and haven't been used other than for fine fossils. Now, the particular site you're seeing right here, I'm using my mouse to show you the bottom here. The site on the left was purchased by the University of Alabama in 1991, specifically May 31st, uh, 1991, from Robert and Nancy Wilson. Um, and they actually still live very close by uh, over there. Um, he couldn't use the land very much. And, and uh, at the time, Douglas Jones, the director of the Alabama Museum, of natural history, he was he was very interested in these in these fossils for multiple reasons, right? Um, for education, for example, but also for for research. And he approached Robert and Nancy Wilson if they wanted to sell it. And they wanted, and after some negotiation and some donations from the, the board of museum regents, uh, they were able to purchase this land in very late May of 1991, and it has been managed by the Elgin Museum of Natural History staff since that time. Now this is a map of Herald Station that I made a while back. And this is showing you the number of gullies and where they are exposed specifically. So on the top left side, you see gully number one, it goes all the way to gully number seven. It cross over to the uh, western part of the property from A to number 23 or so can be found here in the center part, you can find 24 to 26. So still about 15% of the uh, the area is still exposed and actively eroding and can find new fossils every year, really. So once you get there, you actually can follow this particular road right here. So you can stop here and park here and get out and explore gullies number one through seven. But you can also continue and park here on this Green Meadow, called Green Plot right here, and you can follow this walkway all the way back to uh, the other gullies in the, uh, the eastern part of this particular drawing. 
what I mentioned to you here that the site is enclosed by private property. Uh, the UA property itself, you have to go through multiple gates and it's fenced off. So this is unfortunately not a site that everybody can access. So let's talk a bit more about the Mortal Chalk at Arrow Station. What is this chalk actually composed of? Well, first of all, this chalk is a bit of a misnomer. Because chalk implies that pretty much everything you would find is, is limestone. And only about 53% on average of the rocks exposed to Herald Station is actually limestone. This limestone in itself is composed of a variety of microorganisms, mostly probably the forest singles of organisms, uh, but also seed sink or ostracode shells on occasion. You find other micro fossils as well called formifera. They all together, but particularly the corpus of the forest. They compose most of the, the limestone components. Just to give you an idea how common these microfossils are, in about one cubic centimeter, which is the same as a, as a cube of sugar, you can find eight to 10 billion fossils of coccolithophorids. It's astonishing if you think about it. You cannot see them by naked eyes, you need a microscope to find them, but you can always find fossils at the station, even though you may not be able to see them. So 53% is, is limestone. The other parts are 33% of um, clays, particularly the mineral smectite. Um, and there's also sand and silt as a last component. Mostly the mineral quartz you can find in the beaches quite often as well. It's, it's found occasionally as well as part of the, the rocks exposed in the So the age of the rocks. How old is it exactly? Well, it's about 82 million years old. And mostly the microfossils have been used for this purpose. Sort of the coccolids, the pros, and uh, for the minifera. The reason why they have been used is that they are extremely common. As I mentioned already with the example, right, of this super cube. They are widespread. They cannot be found only in Alabama. They, they can be found worldwide um, at a time. And they evolve relatively fast from one species into another one. You can use those principles and determine that the site is most likely about 82 million years old. So Herald Station at the time was way far from the coastline. There's no beach sediments, beach sands. You can find Herald Station. Herald Station was dozens of miles or kilometers away from the coastline from the shore. It was a relatively calm uh, ocean back in the days over there. It was also relatively shallow, most likely less than 200 meters deep, not very shallow either, certainly not uh, below 30 meters. Surface waters were estimated to be about 25 degrees centigrade at the of the, the, the mortal chalk at Aero Station, or 77 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. It's pretty warm, much warmer than it is today, in fact. Geologists have been taking sediment cores as well from the area around Harrow Station, and they found that the total thickness of the Morville chalk at Harrow Station is about 110 meters or 360 feet in total. However, only a part of that is exposed at Harrow Station, but it doesn't erode all the way back to 110 meters depth. Now, at Harrow Station, only 15 to maybe 20 meters of that chalk is exposed, and we can find a variety of fossils. Now, geologists have determined that the sedimentation rate is about 28 meters per million years, and this is really an average. It can vary dramatically depending on um, a variety of, of factors. So if you take these two numbers into account, 110 meters thickness and 28 meters per million years, you can simply, simply do the math and see that uh, the 110 meters was deposited over a time span of about 4 million years. But it's not true for Aero Station, because once again, only 15 to 20 meters is exposed at Aero Station. So the rocks exposed at Aero Station were formed in a period of less than half a million years or so. Let's go into the gullies. This is gully number one. So to get into gully one, number one, you have to descend here on the left hand side to a little path up here is pretty steep. 
and then you can start looking for fossils in the flats or a bit further right here uh, where you see many of these, these nice gullies exposed there as well. So this is a photo that, uh, that I took very late January when, when I visited this site for the first time. You can see uh, together with a team of UA Museum's people right here, you can see Local chart exposed nicely here. Some parts are a little bit darker than other parts. That is because the days before it had rains. So it's still probably drying out, but has other parts that dried up already, particularly the uh, lighter gray parts right here. So this is a photo taken by a drone by the museum's uh, director of collections, John Abbott. You see very nicely here that on the left hand side you see many of the gullies still actively eroding and drying up at the time this photo was taken, as you can see. So lots of new fossils are exposed. Uh, rain hits this part of Alabama, but it's on the right hand side. It's less geographic elevation, of course. And uh, lots of the, uh, the chalks here tend to be overgrown at this, at this point. I'm going to try to show you a video of the drone that John Abbott made. So let's see the place. This is the same part of Gully 1 that we just saw in the photograph, but here you get a better sense of this, at least the size of the Orient and how it looks like in a more three dimensional. At the time we were searching this part of the flats where quite a number of shells were exposed. Now, let's go to this particular slide where we see uh, some of these boots here from Rebecca Johnson's piece specifically. Here. And what you see here that the previous days it had rained quite a bit, actually at Herald Station. And I already mentioned to you that the water has a hard time getting wet. And you saw it can get pretty soggy and wet even the day after it has rained. So what happens then is your boots collect a lot of uh, this chalk, both clays and limestones, mostly right, and it's easy for you to, uh, to collect a couple of uh, chalk quite easily. So you don't move around very easily, easily then anymore. You can make it very slippery. So uh, when it rains, you don't want to go there. That's, that's the fact. On other days, it may get very hot. For example, like over here in the summer, I know that may get easily 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 30, 32 degrees centigrade. And but that's for the surrounding area. It's not at Harold Station. At Harold Station, you've got these white chalks exposed. So temperatures can easily get up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit or uh, 35, 36, 37 degrees centigrade. So you can get really hot there. So if you want to go there, and if we go there. And you always have to take a look at the temperature as well. It can get pretty brutal there before the summer. The nice thing about having sun, regardless of whether it's 90 degrees or only 60 degrees, is that you can see some fossils much better, particularly sharp teeth that do shine right into your eye when the sun is there. So there's a couple of ways how one can collect fossils best. If you're interested in very big bones and very big teeth, and perhaps very big clams as well on occasion. You can just walk around and you may see them that way quite easily. So, um, what's um, visible too here is this one guy in the center here is, is ducking a little bit over and he's finding possible that way. Whereas this guy on the right hand side is, is sitting on his knees and trying to see every fossil there is. And I think that's probably the best way. If you find most fossils, you want to sit on your knees and find, find all fossils the best way you can. Can everybody see and hear me still? Uh, no audio. Uh, so uh, can you hear me? Uh, you need your iPad back up. If you can, if you can uh, hear me. And make sure that you can hear me. I don't hear anybody. Uh, yeah, uh, put your iPad. Uh, I, we lo I lost your I lost your iPad. 
uh, I only have your, uh, uh, your laptop. Um, sorry about this, everybody. Technical difficulties. Uh, trying to, uh, get him set back up with the audio. We had a little bit of a, a workaround for some of that stuff. So okay. I'm going to try to, yeah. So I think we're, we're getting it. Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me now? Let's see. Uh, audio, if you can get your iPad set back up, that's what we need. So yeah, it looks like a, so this is a live, everybody live broadcast. This is, <laughs> this is how things go sometimes, which is all right. Yeah. If you, if you can get the iPad set back up, I think that will, uh, will help a lot so that, so that we can get uh, yeah. your audio a little better. So uh, if, any, if anybody couldn't hear, um, Audio was, to, uh, if you had trouble hearing him, Audio was talking about a, a trip. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can hear you. It's a little, it's still a little bit, um, I still don't see your iPad. Uh, so I only see your laptop. So you might have to go back into the StreamYard link on your uh, your iPad, so we can get, so we can get that device up. So Adiel was telling us about a, a trip that we took back in January to Harrell Her Station, and it was a uh, it was a very interesting trip. It was I think it was everyone uh, that went first time down there to Harrell Her Station, and it had rained uh, a couple of days before, and it had gotten really uh muddy i guess so there was a lot of uh he showed that picture of my boots there and uh it was very uh the the boots uh were covered in that chalk and it made things uh very difficult in terms of um being able to walk which was very very interesting um because uh the chalk actually down there at Harold station gathered so much on our boots that uh, it felt like the your feet weighed so much more than they actually did. Uh, so that was quite the experience in uh, trying to walk down there. Okay, so let me see if I can uh, get his iPad pulled up here. All right, Adiel, can you hear me? Okay. Can, can, can you hear me a little better? I can. All right, can all right, so clear again. Okay, yeah, I think we just lost your iPad there for a second. Uh, so uh, let's uh, try to pick back up uh, maybe where we left off. So do you want to go back anywhere? Um, let's see, where's a good place in your presentation if you want to pull that back up? And we'll yeah, try so to- when did you last hear me? Uh, it's, it's been a while. I've been trying, it's, it's been strange because I, I wasn't able to, to really contact you. Um, so I had to send some messengers over <laughs> to your house. Uh, thankfully, some people we know uh, live near you. So. Uh, yeah, so I guess uh, let's uh, go back to, to when we, if you can, go back to when we took our trip to uh, Harrell Station and maybe talk about that a little bit. We've, we've got about okay. 30 minutes. So, uh, so yeah, let's, uh, let's go back yeah. to. Uh, and if you want to talk about the chalk uh, so people understand what uh, Harrell Station is, is made of. Yeah, well, first of all, I'm sorry for uh, the delay here. Uh, hopefully everything will work nicely from here on. And, so, and, and don't worry, Adiel, that's, that's, yeah, that's a, that's that's a, a, it's a live broadcast. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah, things happen, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, let's go to the Morphal Chalk and I'll tell you briefly what a Morphal Chalk is composed of. The Chalk really is a misnomer and because Chalk is supposed to be pretty much old limestone, which is not the case in the Herald Station. Only about 53% is composed of limestone. Really, the other parts are clays, particularly mineral smectite, but we also have uh, some sand and, and clay size, or and sil sand and sil size particles, actually. That's about 82 million years old. The rocks exposed is quite a ways away from the coastline many dozens of miles or kilometers away from the coastline, so it's a very calm environment, not influenced by storms all that much. It's pretty shallow marine, so it's certainly less than 200 meters in depth, but probably also more than at least 30, 40 meters. It was much warmer back in the days, about 25 degrees centigrade for the surface temperatures of the waters on average. 
And I'm going to skip all this quickly and just tell you briefly that the sediments exposed at Herald Station are in duration deposited in less than half a million years in total. So this is a view from gully number one, looking into gully number one, where you see the flats exposed right here. There's a lot of vegetation in this particular gully as well. And as you walk into gully number one, this is what you would see. You see darker parts, which are still a bit wet, and lighter parts that have dried up already. Here's an aerial view from the top. So you can see on the left hand side, there's still active erosion ongoing, whereas on the right hand side, it's not so much erosion ongoing and it's a bit greener and browner as well, not surprisingly. This is a little drone view that collections director John Abbott took, just to give you a better idea of the extent of at least gully number one. And you can see we are actively searching for fossils in the flatter parts. Sometimes it can get very wet there, particularly a day after the rain or during the rain. Your boots will collect a lot of, uh, all of this chalk. It sticks really easy <laughs> to your feet and it's just very difficult to move around with. Uh, so you definitely don't want to be there when it rains because it may be very hard to get out of the gullies in the first place. Uh, but audio... Uh, uh, the sun I... is a blessing and a curse. Uh, Ariel, yeah. uh, do you want to talk about how sometimes, even though with the chalk and, and the the stuff that gathers on your boots is difficult to walk around on, uh, does it does it benefit you anyway as a paleontologist to be able to, like the rain, does it benefit you uh, to be able to find fossils a little better? Absolutely. We need the rain for new fossils to be exposed, uh, especially when it rains, uh, active erosion takes place and new fossils are exposed every time. So in that sense, rain is very important as well. In fact, without rain, same fossils will be exposed for a very long time. You don't find any new fossils necessarily. So we've got a lot of rain in Alabama in some months, which is absolutely great, but you don't want to be there when it rains. <laughs> <laughs> now the sun is, is a blessing and a curse as well. When temperatures soar over the summer, when it can get to 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 32 degrees centigrade, can get very hot in the surroundings of our station, but within the college, it can get even warmer. And it can easily get to 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees uh, centigrade. It can be pretty brutal there, so you need to bring a lot of uh, water for those days. Now, the sun is also very beneficial in the sense that you can see some fossils at least much better, particularly shark teeth that still have enamel, and that enamel really shines into your eye. So here we are searching for fossils. There's essentially two ways you can look for fossils. You can walk around hoping that you'll find big teeth and big bones, which are pretty rare, but you can also scoot down and sit on your knees and, and, and find fossils that way. You'll find many more fossils that way. They may not all be very big, but many of the small ones can tell you a lot about uh, life that was present at the time as well. So just to give you some examples, so on the right hand side here, we have a tooth of a shark called Squally Corax. On the left hand side, we see a very rare remain of a decapod crustacean. In this case, it's a claw of probably a crab of some kind. Now, in this case, we're looking at a Fossil Friday post on my Twitter account at Paleo, Twitter, at Paleo Adiel. And what you can see here is a starfish or an asteroid or a sea star, depending on which name you prefer very very well preserved you can see the individual parts of the sea star here called ossicles very nicely and, and this specimen can easily be identified to the genius and species levels most of the uh, sea stars you find at herald station are completely paratized that is you can see only the outline and everything else is essentially an, an iron sulfide or fes2 chemically speaking now this is a, a bone of a mosasaur. This is a, a vertebrae actually. So part of the uh, vertebral column of a mosasaur. Mosasaurs are marine reptiles, they're not dinosaurs. And they were pretty common at Herald Station as well. As much as seven species have been found over there. 
Just to give you an idea how these animals may have looked like back in the days, this is a reconstruction of one of the Mosasaur species that has been found at Harold Station. And, and this one uh, was medium in size. Mosasaurs can really differ in size depending on species. Some are only one meter or so, whereas other ones may be as, as, as long as 17 meters or 55 feet or so. They were really the dominant marine predators back in the days in, in, in the late Cretaceous. Just to give you uh, some more examples of fossils that can be found occasionally, this is a tooth of a swordfish-like creature that may grow up to two meters or seven feet in length back in the days. This is just a small example. Here are uh, some fossils that look like clams, but they are not clams. They are in fact part of ammonites. They are the list or jaw parts of an ammonite shell. Ammonite shells really look like uh, nulla shells that are still to the present day, but these are the parts that would essentially close of the opening of this particular shell. They're very rare to find, very rare to find. So, and if you're lucky on a given day, you may find some, some very nice teeth, as you can see right here on the right hand side of my hand here. You can find some vertebrae as well. You can find, find some clams. So what I'm going to do right now is uh, try to show you some of the fossils that I have here on my desk. So I'm going to start with a clam. This is a clam shell right here. It looks pretty nice, very well preserved, pretty complete. We've got an oyster here as well. It looks very jagged. Earlier this year, I found this very nice fossil. This is yep. uh, part of a jaw of a fish. Yeah, you can see, are those teeth at the top with the, the jagged yeah, edges? These are, these are teeth, yeah, yeah. They're teeth, for hmm. sure. You can see better now, I hope. So here we have a larger tooth of the one I just showed you in the picture of this sword-like fish that could grow up to two meters in size. Yeah, that's a big tooth. That's a pretty big tooth, yeah. It's <laughs> about five centimeters or, or two inches in length. Here's another tooth right here of a shark called Creta Xerina Nantelli. Uh, yeah, you might want to move it a little more to the center. Yeah, yeah. that's a pretty big tooth as well. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm selecting the, the big ones because you can see them. <laughs> yes, it's a little easier to see. Yeah, so this is a tooth of a uh, of a <clears throat> mosasaur you can find on occasion as well. This is a relatively small tooth, but there are bigger ones as well. And we get to the really big stuff. This is a, uh, a vertebrae of a mosasaur. Now you can recognize that this is a vertebrae of a mosasaur because it has a concave end, or sorry, a convex end, and a concave end right here. And lastly, what I want to show you is a piece of wood. Even though we're far away from the coastline, you sometimes scan wood that made it into the ocean, was floating for a little while after it sank to the bottom of the ocean, most likely, and got covered by chalk. Those are all really neat. Yeah, so now I'll go back to the presentation. All right. And you might want to hit that hide sharing there at the so bottom. Let's talk about dinosaurs. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there you go. All right. So let's so let's talk about di dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are really rare because dinosaurs were not living in the ocean by any means. Uh, yeah, nevertheless, some dinosaur remains have been found. So on the left hand side, you see uh, a toe bone of a theropod or a, a meat eater. This one right here to the right of it is, is just a drawing, really, but it was part of a hip bone of a notosaurid of some kind, so an ankylosaurian type of dinosaur. This one right here is a reconstruction of the skull of a duck-billed dinosaur or a hadrosaurus of some kind, only the parts in gray or 
actual bones that have been found, whereas the parts in white are reconstructed. Now, one of the most special finds in terms of dinosaurs is this egg. This egg was found in 1970 by Prescott Atkinson. It's also in the Board of Regents of the UN Museums. And <clears throat> he found this oval shaped egg, and in 1978 it was determined to be an egg of amniote. This is the group that contains mammals, reptiles, and birds. However, subsequent research by, by James Lamb was able to find some bones inside, and he thought they actually may belong to a double dinosaur instead. Uh, audio, are you there? I, I think we lost your uh, audio again. Oh, man. Uh, yeah. yeah um, the ocean died and was floating for a period of time before it eventually sent to the bottom of the ocean. I'm going to try. I'm trying to signal to him. Uh, we for a long time, like Mosasaurus and like. I don't know if he can see me. Uh, sharks that you see depicted right here. We need your iPad again. There's right, some other get, great finds. Hang in there with us, guys. This is probably the best. Fish ever preserved to be found at Herald Station called Becky Resolis Minimus. This is the holotype, the, the specimen based upon which a species has been described. And you can see everything here from the uh, vertebral column right here to the uh, eye cavity right here. You can see the jaw right here. You can see fins quite easily here. It's just astonishing. It's very rare to find fish in this type of uh, preservation. Turtles have been found as well, uh, particularly partial turtles. This is, of course, uh, a turtle found in, in, during the 1940s expeditions, and this particular individual is all pieced together again, and to the extent it is very complete. This is also a new species that was described in Herald Station in 1950. So let's take a look at what we actually have in terms of reported fossils that you can see by naked eye or macro fossils. We've got uh, many vertebrate fossils. So far, I've been able to find 53 species reported in, this, in the scientific literature. So they include uh, 31 species of fish. Yeah, uh, audio, it seems like we lost your iPad again. Uh, sorry about the technical diff difficulties, everybody. We've we've got kind of a, 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 a complicated setup here. So, so all right, let's see if we can get it back up and running. All right. Okay, sorry about that audio. Uh, the iPad dropped out again. Can you hear me? Okay, Rebecca. Yes, okay. So we're, go we're good back up. All right, we probably... Yeah, we we probably need some kind of signal. I know you can't see me when when your presentation goes uh, full screen, so uh, so it looks like we're we're good to go again. So if you want to pick up where where you left off, we can we can get back into it. Can you hear me? Looks like he's still trying to. Uh, Rebecca, you want me to start at some point again? Yeah, if you want to, if you, I guess, uh, since uh, we, we've got about 17 minutes left, so if you want to start back up uh, just talking about uh, on your slide the treasure trove of, for fossils and, and talk about what's what's found at Herald Station. So let's see, you want me to go back to a certain part? You cut uh, a little bit, sorry. Uh, if, if you want to uh, go back uh, to this treasure trove for fossils, we'll pick up there and talk about what you find. At Herald Station. Yeah, you can start there. Okay, so we're on slide. Okay. So I'm going to hold the iPad here in my hand, so hopefully uh, the problem will not occur again. Apologies again. So there's lots of fossils that have been found at Herald Station, particularly ones you can see by a naked eye, and the ones that have been reported in this scientific literature are plentiful for the vertebrate vertebrates as you can see right here. Many fish have been reported, turtles have been reported, seven species of mosasaur have been reported, crocodile even, dinosaurs including a bird, because birds are dinosaurs, one pterosaur. Now for the invertebrates on the other hand, it's a very different story. They have hardly been studied. 
only one worm was reported, one moss animal, or bryozoa, and oyster shells have been mentioned on occasion. So there's lots of work to be done on inverts. For the microfossils that have been reported in the literature, there's actually over 100. Even though some research can be done, they have been researched quite well. And from the Pleistocene, which is apparently a layer on top of the Morville chalk, uh, an American mastodon actually was found. Uh, so if you look at the list, you think, well, this is a place that's full of vertebrate fossils, right? But it's not entirely true. Because if you go to Harrow Station, this is a particular shot you may see. You, you see a lot of shells right here, and shells in fact dominate uh, in terms of abundance for sure. And if you're very lucky, you can see a bone, which I'm indicating right here with my, with my mouse. Here. This is a sample that I collected uh, by collecting every fossil for 30 minutes in one of the gullies right here. And this is what you typically find you find 95% bivalves or clams, oyster, you know, ceramic bivalves as well. You find a number of uh, worms as well. You may find some barnacles. And if you're very lucky, you may be part of a vertebrae right here. So that's, that's really what the reality is. Vertebrae tend to be pretty rare, whereas shells and everything. What's reported in the literature and what can actually be found in collections may sometimes be very different. And I'm going to try to show you that right here. So in terms of macrofossils, for sure there are more than 10 fish and shark species to be found in collections that haven't been reported from Herald Station so far. There's a number of other taxa as well. In terms of invertebrates, there's a ton of research that still can be done. There's dozens of bivalve species. There's brachiopods, there's crustaceans, there's ammonites, there's gastropods, starfish, like the example I showed you. Um, corals as well, sea urchins, worms as well. But there's also plant, uh, plants, an example of wood when I was highlighting some of the fossils in front of the screen, right? There's fossil dung, coprolites that have been found there as well, and a variety of this can tell us a lot about how these animals live as well. And for the microfossils, the uh, fossils that were living on the bottom of the ocean have not been studied very well. So there's not only fossils you can find at Aral Station, there's actually wildlife as well that you may, you may come across. Here's a photo that I shot uh, from a number of birds. Two birds were attacking one bird here actually. There's a variety of plants that are quite unique to the uh, to the chalk environments that you can see. If you're lucky, you may see a coyote. You can find dragonflies as well. There's a lot of tracks and traces as well made by extant animals, like this trace made by a bird. This track is made by a coyote. You may not see coyotes very often, but the tracks really tell you that they were pretty common there. This is a uh, footprint of a deer. This is a foot a coyote or a, I'm sorry, a raccoon. So if you're interested in present life found at Herald Station, I invite you to go over to iNaturalist, this particular website you see right here. You can, you can see um, the plants and animals and tracks that have been found at Harold Station in the surrounding area so far. This data has been collected by a variety of people. So how has Harold Station been used? Well, it's been used a lot for scientific research. If you look at a number of scientific papers and books that have been, have been published over time, you see that some publications were done in 1940s all the way up to the 2000s, but typically less than five per decade. But particularly in the last decade, uh, there's really a spike in research based on, on the fossils of Herald Station. And expect this to continue for this particular decade. Well, like I mentioned, new species have been described from, from Herald Station as well. 14 new species have been described. 
12 are still considered valid and they include turtles, fishes, a dinosaur, but also a shark. It's likely that more of them are hiding out there. So, so keep track of what's going on with Herald Station. Herald Station has also been used for education. So the uh, ALMNH or Alabama Museum, actually, so Museum Expedition has since 1979 has been coming to Herald Station a number of times in 1982, 1988, 1993, and last year as well. And to the right side, you see a shot of uh, Harrow Station in 2019 when high school kids were doing field work there and learning to, to become a paleontologist, perhaps. It has been used extensively for classes as well, particularly classes related to paleontology and marine science, but also classes related to modern plants and tracks and traces sometimes have been going to Harrow Station. So in sum, Arrow Station is and remains one of the important Cretaceous paleo sites east of the Mississippi River. There are a lot of macro fossils that can be found at Arrow Station, over 100 species. For sure, micro fossils, same story. Lots of research still can still be done on the varied fossils, but particular research interest should be uh, given to invariate fossils because they have hardly been studied from Arrow Station. There's definitely an increase in interest, as we've seen in one of the previous slides, uh, 20 publications uh, last decade. And also remains an important site for, for educational purposes. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, people who have contributed to this presentation in one way or another. And I also want to thank a lot of people who have been collecting fossils at Harrow Station donating them to the Museum of Natural History, as well as researchers that have studied them. So we know a lot about Herald Station now as compared to, let's say, 50 years ago. So this is the end of my presentation. So yeah, so Adiel, we have a we question. Over to questions, if there are any. Yeah, so uh, Destry asks, can anyone go to Herald Station to explore? So that's a really good question. So what, how would you answer that, Adiel? Yeah, well, so Herald Station is uh, enclosed by private property, and Herald Station itself is fenced off, and there are a number of gates, to. Uh, so it's unfortunately not a site that the general public can go to. Uh, but particularly if you sign up for classes and in paleo and geology, you may be able to go there. and. If the museum expedition in the future would include fossils again, uh, then we may go to Harrow Station again. Yeah, uh, and uh, your your first uh, time at Harrow Station was in January, and I, I think that group of folks that we went down there, everybody that that was all of our first times uh, to go down there. Uh, but but it does sound like classes do go down there, and and you do have to have certain permissions. Even even we had to fill out forms. Uh, even though we're part of the museum's, uh, you know, the museum, UA Museum's family, we still had to fill out uh, forms to be able to access um, that uh, area. Yeah, and uh, Adiel also mentioned in his uh, presentation that there's an iNaturalist project for Herald Station. Um, so that's cool. That's something I didn't know. So I'm going to have to go and, and look, for, look for that. Can anybody join the project in iNaturalist? Absolutely. Yeah, everybody's able to see what's being found. Um, if you happen to be at Harrow Station or in these areas surrounding Harrow Station, uh, then you are able to contribute even. All right, let's see. Uh, I think you talked about the research that you do. Uh, you talked about... Uh, so actually, there is a question I don't know if we uh, mentioned in the presentation, but how old is Harrow Station in, rela in relation to other fossil sites in Alabama? Do you know uh what it what other fossil sites are in alabama well, alabama is blessed in the way that there's many rocks of different ages exposed you can find fossils that are 500 million years old in alabama particularly in the northern part of alabama you can find fossils that are 300 million years old uh, many plants and trackways have been found up north if you go to the middle part of alabama there's lots of late cretaceous rocks exposed um, sites that range in age from about 
about 90 million years old to about 66 million years old. If you go to the southern part of Alabama, rocks of very different ages are exposed, all the way from um, Paleocene, so let's say 65 million years ago, to pretty much the present day. So in that sense, if you like old fossils, just go to the north. If you like uh, Cretaceous sharks and mosasaurs, uh, stick to the center of the state. If you want to find lots of shells, if you want to find whales sometimes, you may want to stick to the, the southern part of the state. So there's, but it really depends on where exposures are. I should mention that uh, these exposures are everywhere, of course. We're not in a desert. Alabama has, has largely been vegetated. So you would often have to rely on, 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 on the sites that are along stream banks, along rivers, um, or some, some other sites out of state that are accessible as well. So if you really want to search for fossils, I would definitely recommend you to become a member of the, the Birmingham Paleo Society or the Alabama Paleo Society. Both are located in, in, in Birmingham, Alabama. And they go fossil collecting every month or so, uh, well, except for these months during the pandemic, but those are great ways to get to know other people who collect fossils, go to a uh, variety of fossil sites in the state uh, once every month, typically on a Saturday. So it's a great opportunity for you to, to learn more about fossils. Uh, what would you recommend for somebody, say, like me, who has no idea how to spot a, a fossil? Uh, what would you... Uh... What would, what would uh, your tips be for someone who just wants to go try looking for fossils for the first time? Yeah. So it's, I think it's important that you um, take a look at if, where fossils have been found in the first place. Um, there's, there's so many sites that are totally vegetated. You, you will not find any fossils right there. Talk to uh, paleo societies, see where they go for fossil collecting. Um, if you really get interested in fossils, buy a book on fossils of Alabama. And, and you know, the, here I've got a book right in front of me, in fact, called Lost Worlds in Alabama Rocks. This talks about all the rock layers exposed in Alabama and all the fossils that can be found within. Um, so that's a great way to get to see how these fossils look like in the first place. Well, uh, we're almost out of time, Adiel. So I, I'll give you the last word. So, what what would you want people to leave with uh, with your presentation? What do you What do you hope people take away from uh, your experience with Harold Station and uh, the fossils that are found there? Yeah, I mean, Harold Station is a fantastic site. It's a treasure trove of fossils. Uh, you know, vertebrate fossils that have been studied for a very long time, and there's in fact a spike in the in increase or there's an increase in research done at Harold Station uh, for vertebrate fossils, but uh, inverts are a real opportunity too for research, well, for research uh, at least. Uh, so there's, although Harold Station has been known for, since the 1940s, we're nowhere near done uh, what we know about Harold Station research wise. Um, so there's so many opportunities there, and I invite everybody to come over to the Alabama Museum collection and see what's out there and see if there's anything that is of interest to you uh, research-wise. Yeah, Harold Station is a very interesting place. It's visually very interesting. It has all of those gullies. Uh, it has the, the chalk that can sometimes get muddy, but it's a very a unique place. And uh, so I, I think uh, it's very cool that you gave this talk and let people know about it today. And uh, if, if I can speak on behalf of Jill here, who, who left a comment, she said, uh, thank you to Adiel. Uh, this, this presentation was very interesting. So uh, thank you, Jill, for watching. And uh, I guess that will do it for uh, our time here about Harold Station. So thank you for everybody who came to the Museums from Your Home live stream. We do apologize for some of the, the technical uh, uh, difficulties that we had, but we got back up and running. And so hopefully uh, you all got something out of what we talked about here today. We will be doing this every weekday, Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. And each day will feature a different aspect of a UA museum. So tomorrow on Friday, we'll actually be coming back here to the Alabama Museum of Natural History's Facebook page uh, to find out and ask the question, where does our food come from? So that'll be really fun. That'll be more uh, family oriented. So if you've got some kids, that would be a good one to watch with us. And if you are enjoying uh, museums from your home and what we're doing here with these live streams, uh, let me pull up a 
little graphic here so, to help everybody out. Um, you can become a supporting member of UA Museums. You can go to give.ua.edu slash museums if you do feel so inclined to do that. We do appreciate everyone's support. If you want to get more information about what we're doing here with these live streams, you can go to museums.ua.edu slash museums from your home. And that will have everything that you need to know about what our online initiative is. It has uh, links to Discovering Alabama's educational resources, including their free episodes and teacher guides. It has a link to the Alabama Museum of Natural History's Teacher's Corner. So if you uh, want to uh, do some stuff with your kids in terms of uh, some of the homeschooling people are having to do these days, uh, you can find resources there. We also have a link to our Color Our Collections coloring book, which is really cool. And it has some, I think, uh, shark teeth in there in one of the pages that I think might have been taken from uh, Herald Station. Uh, so there's some uh, shark teeth there in, uh, in that coloring book. And so all of the uh, resources that you might need for educational purposes and for all of the archival, uh, uh, the archive of our live streams, uh, you can find everything that we've been doing there. There are links to our isolation observation videos and our Mountville Monday videos. So if you have any questions about what we're doing here with UA Museums online, you can go to museums.ua.edu slash museums from your home. And uh, I just want to thank everybody for coming and joining us this morning to learn more about Harold Station and some of the paleontology that Adiel is bringing it to UA Museums. So thank you for uh, coming by and for visiting UA Museums from your home. All right. Well, have a great day, everybody. Have a great day, Adiel. Have a great day, too, everybody. Talk to you later.